Thank you very much, Paul, um, for the very kind introduction and for not talking about the, the unfinished book. <laughs> I could admit it. The thing Paul didn't say is that he was my PhD supervisor, which is part of the reason why I always have great explosions of guilt at undone work <laughs> whenever I see him. Uh, I'll try and suppress that for the rest of this evening. So thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you for coming. Um, when the email arrived inviting me to give this talk, it had, and from Fiona, it had two observations. The first was that I hope that I would be able to, I quote, cheer up a cold February evening. And the second was that 2024 marks the 2,500th anniversary of the formation of the Debian League, the thing that you know, we tend to call the Athenian Empire, and the 2,400th anniversary of what was or has often been seen as its successor organization, the so-called Second Athenian League, established in 3787. Looking at the charter document of it on, on the screen, maybe, said the email, I could find something to say inspired by one or other of those chronological coincidences. Now, I'm not sure that cheering up and the Athenian Empire could ever belong in the same sentence, so I make no promises on that front. But the point about the double anniversary did get me thinking, and in particular thinking about the question which has long exercised um, historians of, of classical Greece. That's to say, how can we explain the resilience, the persistence of Athenian power, hegemonic power, imperial power? I'm not going to get into the question of labels, but if people want to argue about that uh, later, then, then please do. I'll call it imperial as a shorthand. Uh, how can we explain the resilience of that power over a reasonably extended period, not much compared with the Romans, perhaps, but um, in the context of the, of the Greek world, um, a fairly impressive stretch over a, a hundred, almost 150 years. On the slide, you've got the conventional chronology. I'm sure this is familiar, but just to, re to refresh people's memories if needed. Uh, the Delian League Athenian Empire created in 4787, formally dissolved in 4043 at the end of the Peloponnesian War to, according to Xenophon, the sound of flute girls celebrating the destruction uh, of Athens' walls or the, the long walls to Piraeus. Um, the Second Athenian League uh, formed in 3787. It's hard to say exactly when it ends because it sort of really goes out with a, a whimper rather than a bang that sort of falls apart uh, progressively from the 350s onwards. Um, so to come back to my question, how can we explain how the Athenians managed to uh, to, to retain some degree of power over such a long period. The most common way of formulating or sort of subdividing or, or expressing that question has, has been to think about it in terms of how questions of how the Athenians acquired that power, how did they, how did they exercise their control over subject states, or also a related question, how did they conceptualise, how did they represent their power and then further to frame that question in terms of continuity and change. Is there a significant change in Athenian power between the 5th and the 4th centuries, or is it essentially the same thing all the way through? Now, those are certainly worthwhile questions, and I'll spend some time on it uh, this evening. But what I also want to suggest is that there's something to be gained by trying to think about those things, about the nature of Athenian power, the resilience of power, not in terms of Athenian attitudes and motivations, but from the perspective of the communities that were subject to it. And that's what I'll try and do in the second and rather longer part of this talk. So that starts, though, with the view from Athens. And let's start, since I put it in the title, uh, with the concept of imperial tyranny. That's to say the view of that Athenian power over its subject allies is best understood by analogy with the power of a tyrant over his subjects. And to spell that out, tyrannical power when exercised by uh, 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 a literal tyrant is acquired illegitimately or at least with dubious legitimacy it's sustained by force it might promise some superficial benefits to its subjects but its ultimate game uh, goal is to enrich the ruler and very importantly it's inherently fragile uh, precisely because it relies on coercion it could only survive while the tyrant retains that coercive power now, for the idea that Athenian imperial power was conceptualized as tyrannical, we can go, first of all, and most obviously, to Thucydides. Now, it's very important to note that Thucydides never in his own narr narrative voice makes this comparison, but he makes several speakers make this comparison, and their speakers about whom Thucydides seems to have different opinions, so it's not straightforwardly the case that 
it's a thing that good guys say or bad guys say. We get a variety of people saying it. So here is, I've gone a little too far, here is Pericles um, saying to the Athenians, your empire is like a tyranny. Taking it might have been a mistake, but letting it go would be a disaster. So the, the point here is that, again, the fragility of tyrannical power because the tyrant has to rule by force because everybody hates him. So if you, if you drop your guard for a moment, your power will, will, will go away. Very strikingly, Cleon, who, as you know, Thucydides despises, makes pretty much exactly the same point, even in very similar formulation. Um, again, re points out to the Athenians that they haven't realised this essential point. They think that they're Democrats. They think they're the nice guys. They haven't realised that they're the tyrants entirely forgetting that your empire is a tyranny, your subjects are disaffected conspirators, whose obedience is ensured not by your suicidal concessions, but by your superiority. Uh, so the same idea recurs. And then the third Athenian speaker who makes the comparison is the wonderfully named Euphemus, Mr. Goodspeak. Uh, speaking in this instance, not to Athenians, but to, to other Greeks, to Sicilians. And the thing that strikes me about his use of the analogy here is that he just takes it as absolutely straightforward. Um, that this is just a given. Uh, the same modes of logic of rule applies both to tyrants and to imperial powers. They behave in the same ways. So it's very clear that Thucydides wants to make his characters represent Athenian imperial power in the 5th century as tyrannical. The next problem, of course, when, when, when dealing with Thucydides is, was that just an idea that Thucydides had? his strange Thucydidean head, or was it something that was more, more widely uh, thought in, in the 5th century? Um, I think there's just enough evidence to suggest that this was a more widely held belief, and here I draw on I think the still fundamental uh, discussion of this by Christopher Tuplin in a very important article in a very important collection edited by Professor Cartledge, which is not the only reason that I mention it, but... Um, but Toplin sort of collates the various allusions or references to imperial tyranny and points out things like this, a sort of throwaway line in Aristophanes Nights in which Demos, the Athenian people, is talked to as if it were a tyrant, not just over other people in Athens, but over everyone. So this is tyranny that stretches beyond the edge of Athens. So we've got imperial tyranny in the 5th century, for my purposes today, I need also to find it in the 4th century or, or to see if that way of thinking about imperial power persists down into the 4th century. And the good news for me, sort of, is, is that it is there. It's there most strikingly in a speech of Isocrates from the middle of the 4th century, from the 350s. Um, Isocrates, first of all, is very clear, maybe gives us the most clear fullest worked out picture of the 5th century empire as a tyrant empire. Isocrates is not a subtle writer, so one thing, one thing that he's useful for is absolutely spelling out what the point is, and that's what he's doing here, is making very explicit how that analogy between tyranny and imperial power works. Um, people who exercise legitimate rule make their subjects happier. People who dominate just provide pleasures for themselves through... Uh, the hardships of others. Um, people who attempt the tyrant's cause must encounter disasters and be afflicted by the very things they inflict on others. And it is just this which has happened in the case of Athens. He's talking in this bit of the speech about the 5th century empire and explaining why the 5th century empire collapsed. What he does later in the speech is argue that exactly the same thing is happening in his own time, that the 4th century Athenians are flirting with or perhaps have even started to behave in exactly the same way. They're behaving like a tyrant rather than a legitimate ruler in their relations with other Greeks. And, says Isocrates, therefore exactly the same thing is going to happen uh, to their to their fourth century attempt at being the leading power. So for Isocrates, there's a fundamental similarity, and it's a bad similarity, between the nature of Athenian rule across this 150-year period. This is rule as, as tyranny. Now, a good rule of thumb of Greek history is to be very cautious of placing too much weight on anything Isocrates thought or said. It's such a lesson taught to me by Paul early in, in my PhD. So can, can we nail any of this down a bit more securely? And in particular, 
does that picture of, of continuity of, of ideology have any relation to what we see the Athenians actually actually doing? Now, to answer that, we could take a very quick look, don't worry, at the institutions of Athenian power across the two centuries. For the 5th century empire, the starting point for this is, of course, uh, Thucydides 196. This is his account of the formation of the Delian League. And here we see the thing which will perhaps become most emblematic of the 5th century empire, namely the collection of tributes. So the Athenians, at the start of the League, establish which cities are going to contribute ships, which are going to give them money. Very quickly, most ships, most states end up giving them money rather than ships, and they institute some officials, the treasurers of Hellas, and they start to collect the tributes, which is initially 460 talents. Um, this starts off at Delos and then moves to Athens uh, later in the century. Now, Thucydides, to be honest, is not much use for other imperial institutions, but their existence can be pieced together from other particularly epigraphic evidence. We see imposition of garrisons, imposition of governors and other magistrates, intervention in domestic politics, particularly, though not only, through the imposition of democratic constitutions, legal and judicial restrictions, economic sanctions, and property confiscations is the very short checklist of bad things the Athenians do in their 5th century empire. If we jump forward 100 years, the foundation document for the Second Athenian War offers us a picture which is both notably similar and fundamentally different. So one thing that's very clear from this document is that the same sorts of institutions are still very much on the Athenians' radar. So we have garrisons and governors, we have payment of tribute, uh, and we have a uh, possibility of interference in uh, political, in internal political constitution. Um, slightly later in the text, uh, there's a uh, reference to property confiscations. What's also very clear, though, or at least asserted in this document, is that these are things which the Athenians are not going to do. This is a renunciation of a previous approach to imperial power. Athens is turning over a new hegemonic leaf. The problem, of course, is whether or not we should believe it. Uh, this is a problem, in fact, which applies also to the 5th century league, uh, which also started out with promises. This was going to be an alliance fighting the Persians, which seem very quickly to have been forgotten, if indeed they were ever even slightly sincere. So this is Thucydides' three paragraphs after he has told us about the foundation of this league as something which is going to fight Persia, telling us about the fact that the Athenians very quickly start to tighten the screw. Uh, allies try to leave, can't leave. Uh, the Athenians were not the old popular rulers they had been at first three paragraphs ago in, in Thucydides' text. This happens very fast for Thucydides. So that sort of evolution or mission creep uh, of, of empire happens in the 5th century. Does it happen in the 4th? Um, this is a much debated point, but it seems to me that there is plenty of evidence that points to violating violations of the undertakings of the prospectus of the League, and I'll give you just one uh, this evening for the sake of time. So... If we go to the lovely island of Chaos, just to the south of Attica, uh, and the city of Eulis, the lovely city of Eulis on Chaos, um, we find the Athenians up to stuff, I think, in, in, in Eulis in 3632. We can reconstruct, I think, from what's said in this inscription. Uh, we only hear about this from, from the inscription. Um, what's been going on? There's been some sort of stasis civil war in this city, um, an anti-Athenian faction has taken over, severed ties with Athens, kicked out the pro-Athenians. The pro-Athenians have gone to Athens, got some help, got themselves reinstated. And what's happening now is Athens is reasserting its power over the city of Eulis. Um, in more detail, there is significant extraction of money going on. Three talents, it turns out, the people of Eulis owe to Athens in spite of the fact that they were in this organisation which had promised that they weren't going to be extracting Foros. How does it come to be that they owe three talents? This is a mystery. Um, for comparison, in the 5th century empire, the entire island of Chaos paid 1.2 talents of tribute. So all of the cities, four cities together, paid that much. 
and now one city owes three talents. Some, something fishy, I think, is going on. There's very clearly interference in domestic politics. Um, to be fair, the, the people of Ulis, uh, the pro-Athenian faction, have a little bit more say about, about how this settlement is going to be reached, but the Athenians are definitely meddling in questions of the return of exiles. There's been punishment, people have been condemned to death, inscriptions are being knocked over, uh, property is being confiscated. Um, we don't, in this text, have any evidence for a garrison or for a governor, but we do have other uh, inscriptions from other places, which so the Athenians were using these instruments in this period. None of this seems to be straightforwardly consistent with what had been promised in the terms of the prospectus of the Second League. All of it looks notably reminiscent of what Athens had got up to in the 5th century empire. The problem, though, is... How far can we generalise? That is, given that our evidence for Athenian behaviour is hugely incomplete, how far can we extrapolate a general model of imperial or hegemonic practice uh, from our scattered bits uh, of evidence? Now, this problem is often thought to be especially acute for the Second Athenian League, but actually I think it applies just as much to the 5th century empire. What tends to happen in scholarship, and I'm now generalising hugely, so apologies to anyone whose work I'm misrepresenting, but to generalise hugely, what tends to happen, these things work in different directions in the two centuries. So in the fifth century, we're guided by Thucydides' sweeping generalisation that the empire is a tyranny. Uh, and we tend to assume that everybody in the empire is having a horrible time unless we have specific evidence to show that they're not. So sometimes we have evidence the cities get a quite a good deal, and we see those as the exception to the general rule of misery. Uh, in the fourth century, our guiding text is the prospectus of the league, and there's a tendency then, when we get evidence that doesn't fit with that model, to treat that as the exception. So we assume that everybody's having quite a nice time, except when we've got evidence like this, which shows that they're not. Um, and then we just sort of don't think too much about the fact that the Athenians have clearly got officials in the 4th century whose job it was is to go around the islands and squeeze money out of people. We just we prefer not to think too hard about that. Um, so, as I've hinted, one problem with this, and, and I think a problem which looking at the longer time span makes clearer, is that we're very conditioned by the largely accidental nature of the, the pattern of the surviving evidence. Our dominant and our agenda setting source for the fifth century is Thucydides. Uh, he depicts the Athen Athenians as from a very early point seeking to impose or being allowed to impose tight controls over its whole empire. He repeatedly makes his speakers characterize this rule as tyranny. There's not much scope for nuance here. And I think it's still the case in spite of huge changes in the way that we read Thucydides and the way we treat him as a source, um, that approaches to the fifth century empire tend to start from Thucydides and then work out how to fit the other evidence around it, as indeed I have done today. In the 4th century, we lack any literary source with the authority of Thucydides, but what we have got is the official inscribed statement of Athenian aims and objectives, and here too we tend to make that our starting point and then try and explain or explain away the stuff that doesn't fit. That's all extremely understandable in terms of historical method, but it's also, of course, very problematic partly because it makes us beholden to a largely random pattern of extant evidence, but also, and I think more importantly, because even if we were to find some way to get more holistic, a more holistic view of things, even if a whole load of new inscriptions from the 5th century turned up, or we found a 4th century Thucydides, I just don't quite want to think about what that would be like, but there's some, some new text turns up which gave us that sort of... Uh, authoritative narrative from the, from the fourth century. Maybe it'll turn up in, in Herculaneum, who knows. Uh, but even if that were to happen, we'd still only be looking at one side of the picture, and that's the view from Athens. And also, we'd be assuming that there is a holistic picture, that there's just one experience of the Athenian Empire, one way to characterise it. That, sort of, that approach, that lumping rather than splitting, is itself quite a subjective one, it seems to me. And the subjectivity is also quite a hegemonic subjectivity. This is a thing that empires like to do. They like to simplify and homogenize and universalize um, rather than allow for, for differentiation. 
So that seems to me is, is, is the problem. How do we get out of that trap? I already told you at the beginning of the talk what I think the answer is, or some of the answer is, uh, we stop trying to analyse empire only from the perspective of the imperial power, and we try instead to get a better sense of how things look from the perspective of subject states. I am absolutely not the first person to try and do this. I make no claim at all to originality in this. People have been trying for a long time. A lot of research, particularly early research, was hampered by lack of evidence. As everybody knows, there's not much evidence in the classical period from certainly the early classical period from outside Athens. But there have been real advances recently, partly because there is more and more evidence, particularly archaeological evidence, becoming available. Also because there are now, I think, better theoretical models for trying to think about the subject experience of empire from work done in other periods and other places. So the question for the second part of this talk is, what does empire look like from the periphery rather than the centre? And again, the sort of sub-question is, what might that mean for questions of continuity and change? Is it very different to be a subject of the Athenian Empire in the 5th century than it was in the 4th century? So the first thing I want to explore is the possibility that the periodization I gave you at the start of this talk doesn't work once we get outside Athens. That model that we have a block of power from 478 to 404, then everyone has a breather, 25 years, and then we start again in 378 with the second attempt. Um, I want to suggest that for at least some of the subject allies, 404 and 378 are actually that important in terms of shaping their experience of Athenian power. If there's a change, or at least one important moment of change, might in fact come rather earlier, around about 413 BCE and the following years. Two things happen at this point. The first is something notoriously underexplained, underreported by Thucydides, and that is that the Athenians stop collecting tribute. Uh, Thucydides mentions this, this is it, debt, um, that they, instead of the tribute, start to impose a 5% import and export tax. Um, now, this is significant in various ways, but it seems to me that one, poss one possible outcome of this is that this shift from tribute to taxation represents quite a fundamental change in the way that Athens exercises power over the subject allies and more broadly the relationship between Athens and the subject allies. It's very hard to crunch the numbers because we don't have them. So working out the fiscal impact of this change on communities or individuals is quite tricky. Tom Figuera has done it's tried very hard and I think probably got as far as it's possible to get, but it's still pretty uncertain, it seems to me. But I think if we think about the administrative impact, then we're on safer ground. Collecting tribute is a massive operation. It requires officials, it requires people from subject communities to go to Athens to take this stuff, to check this stuff. Um, it's, a, it's all a business that sort of manifests the, the imminence of Athenian power over these subject communities, and that goes. Uh, so a phrase that Tom Figuera has used is that this, this removes, he calls it a zone of friction between Athens and the empire. It may well be that there are communities in the empire for whom payment of tribute is basically their only, the only thing they do, the only contact that they have with Athens in any year. If they're not paying tribute anymore, what sort of relationship, in what sense are they still members of the empire? Hard question to answer because... Those sorts of states are precisely the states that, that never feature in our historical record. But I think we might reasonably assume that for some communities, the abolition of tribute really is a fundamental change in their relationship with Athens. It's still, taxation is still a subordinate relationship, we should be clear. The Athenians are still asserting the right to, to make money out of the subjects, but it plays out in a rather different way. I'm going to come back to taxation in, in a few minutes, or it'll reappear. But for now, I want to stay in the 410s for a little bit longer so to talk about the second big change that happens in this period, and that is this wave of rebellions and secessions from the empire that starts after Athenian defeat in Sicily in 413. We know about 28 rebellions, and I strongly suspect that that is a, a huge underreporting of the number of total number of states that actually left the empire or attempted to leave the empire 
uh, at this point. Um, and that question of rebellion brings me to a second theme. What do subject communities do with this chance to, to get out of Athenian control, to reset their relationship with Athens? And the key claim I want to make here is that there isn't a single pattern. Different states do different things, and looking at those differences, I think, can help help us get a little bit further in understanding uh, their different experiences and responses to Athenian power. I'm just going to give you three examples, not 350, don't, don't worry. Um, so let's start in Miletus. Miletus uh, rebels successfully from the Athenian Empire in 412 BCE. At around this time, if we accept uh, Driscoll's dating of this inscription, they set up a magistrate list which stretches way back into the 6th century. So they reinvent their past and sort of write out a new version of the history of Miletus. This is a list of the list of eponymous magistrates you're looking at. And this sort of thing, slightly counterintuitively, but it also sort of makes sense, is a very well attested thing that Greek states do when they want to mark a new start. So they appeal to their distant past in order to sort of set out on, on a new foot. New, and, and the suggestion is that the Milesians are doing this as part of the process of marking a complete rupture of the, the relationship which has been in place for much of the 5th century in which they've been subordinate to Athens. And in fact, Miletus, as far as we can tell, I'm always very nervous about asserting a negative because I just think I've probably missed a bit of evidence. So please tell me if anyone can find any evidence for any sort of Milesian official interaction with Athens until the early 4th century, because that's the earliest one I can find is 3043 BC. Miletus has absolutely nothing to do with Athens for the rest of the 4th century. So they make their break in 412, they make their new history with, with no Athens in it, and then they just go off and, and carry on doing their own thing in terms of their diplomatic and, and political uh, relations. Example number two, Eretria which is in some ways similar, in some ways different. Eretria rebels in 411. Um, and again, here we get some evidence of, of a, an attempt to sort of signal a new beginning. Uh, this is a, an Eretrian decree uh, passed, we assume, in 411 because we can map what talks about here with some... What Thucydides tells us about the rebellion. We know that there was support from, from Taras. Um, the Eretrians are honouring someone who's helped them uh, free themselves, liberate the city from the Athenians. They're making him a proxenos. So this sets up, this isn't just thanks for the past, this is setting up a new diplomatic tie between Eretria and Taras. This is the sort of thing that subject communities in the 5th century don't do. Uh, Athens sort of runs, runs the show in terms of their diplomacy. So Eretria is, is, as soon as it's liberated, as far as we can see, setting up this monument, proclaiming it, it's now able to make its own diplomatic connections, and particularly with people who, like them, aren't keen on the Athenians. What the Eretrians do, which is different from the Milesians, is that they do drift back into the Athenian sphere of influence, but they seem to do it in a rather, in, in a different way. Um, so this is not a well-preserved inscription, as you can see. Uh, it's an Athenian decree, uh, talking about a, some sort of alliance between the Eretrians and the Athenians. What strikes me as interesting here is the the last extant clause, which, unless the restoration has gone very wildly wrong, um, gives seems to show that this is going to be a partnership of equals, that Eretria and Athens are going to deliberate in common to decide what the terms of their relationship should be like. So Eretria is still happy to have relations with Athens, but this is now on a basis of equality rather than subordination. And then, so that's the background with which Eretria signs up to join the Second Athenian League. That's not at all clear, but under the yellow, that is the name of Eretria on the list of states which, which join the Second Athenian League in 3787, hoping, maybe delusionally, but hoping that presumably this new mode of relations with Athens in which they were equals rather than subordinates might continue. 
my last example, which is a bit longer, is um, cladsomony, where things play out rather differently. Um, now, our best evidence for what's going on in cladsomony comes from this inscription. Um, I've forgotten it's Rhodes Osborne number. Rhodes Osborne 18. The text I'm giving you in the translation is from Attic Inscriptions Online, which is a slightly more up-to-date text and also is a chance for me to plug Attic Inscriptions Online, an excellent website supported by the British School of Athens and by Durham University. All of your Athenian inscriptions, all in translation, all freely available. Do, do go and visit it with commentary and pictures. Um, we're going to work through this text bit by bit, so don't worry about reading the whole thing in, in one go. I wanted you to get a sense of what, what we've got left for the whole thing. Uh, now, Rhodes and Osborne, this is a text of, of uh, 3876. Rhodes and Osborne, in, in their title, call it Athens Honours Cladsomony, and there is an honorific aspect to it. Um, uh, the, uh, the Athenians praise the Cladsomony and Demos for their enthusiasm towards Athens now and in time past. But there's a lot more going on here too, and as has often been observed, a lot which looks very reminiscent of Athens' 5th century behaviour. Most striking, the Athenians are threatening or waving the threat or the promise of the imposition of a garrison and governor. It's set out in quite a hedged way. So the Athenians, first of all, are going to decide whether they, the Athenians, want to impose a garrison and governor, but they're also going to allow the people of Cladsomony to request a garrison and governor if they want one. I'll come back to this. Um, it seems the text sort of breaks up in the end. It looks like the Athenians ultimately decide that they don't want to impose the garrison, but the threat, the possibility is there. And then the second striking thing in the text is the reference to the 5% tax, the acoste. Um, <clears throat> many people have noted this looks very similar to the 5% tax that Thucydides tells us about uh, in 413. It seems simplest to assume that it's basically the same thing. Possibly the Athenians stopped levying it for a little bit towards the end of the Peloponnesian War, but as soon as they could, they start uh, collecting it again. Now, from an Athenian perspective, this all makes perfect sense. It fits very well into Isocrates' picture that the Athenians haven't changed. And that's something we see in other sources as well. Xenophon makes some Thebans turn up in Athens and say, oh, we all know, everyone in Greece knows that you want your empire back. So here they are getting their empire back, or at least the key bits of it. There's financial exploitation, there's political and military control. More broadly, the Athenians are asserting their right to make decisions about the behaviour of states uh, which aren't Athens. There's some willingness to hear the Cladsomenian side of things. They get some level of agency. Athens isn't straightforwardly being an imperial tyrant here, but this fits quite well into an increasingly sort of, uh, I think, persuasive model for understanding how Athenian imperialism works in the fifth century, which is um, that it works to at least some degree through negotiation. Um, so the Athenians are a little bit more context sensitive in the deals that they cut with with member states or subject states. In, in the empire. In fact, even framing this in terms of that, uh, the praise for loyalty, because um, that, that's something the Athenians start to do already at the end of the fifth century. Uh, and Leia Lazar, in her brilliant book on the Athenian empire out last week, or the start of this week, um, has argued that we don't need to see this as evidence that the Athenians are nice, or even that, you know, that they genuinely want to praise people um, but what this might be is evidence for a, a more sort of codified way of handling an empire, of setting the rules of the game um, so that both parties are a bit clearer on where they stand and, and what might be granted and what what uh, is going to be allowed or denied. Um, so that's, that's the Athenian side of things. What about the Cladsomenians? Why, other than the fact that the Athenians are going to march in and kill them all if they don't agree, What's in it for Cladsomony? Well, why are they willing to, to enter into this negotiation? So the most important bit of context to explain this, I think, is that all of this is happening in the context of stasis. So there has been civil war in Cladsomony. <clears throat> An oligarchic faction, probably also a pro-Persian faction, has seized power. 
has then been ousted and has set up a sort of mini splinter clad zomini on the mainland at uh, a place called Kaiton, uh, exact location uncertain, um, but somewhere pretty close to clad Um And the problem now is what's going to happen to that splinter community? Are they going to be allowed to reintegrate into clad or are they going to stay? sitting scowling at the, uh, the democratic Cladzomanians from across the water. Um, so that's that's what the Cladzomanians get out of dealing with Athens, or a really important thing, is that they get Athenian support in solving this internal problem. And the other very important thing to be aware of is that this isn't a new problem for the people of Cladzomany. This has been bubbling along since at least 412 and maybe earlier. So we first hear about stasis in Cladzomeni from Thucydides uh, uh, in Book 8, uh, uh, in his account of what's going on in 412. And it plays out in a very similar way. It's immensely confusing, and I'm going to spare you all of the details because it's, it's a Wednesday night in February. But it keeps being stasis. One party keeps going over to the mainland, forming a splinter community. Then they come back and they swap around, and then they move around again. Uh, it's very confusing. Ultimately... Uh, a key thing to be aware of or to notice in how this plays out is that often the solution involves the people of Cladzomeni appealing to some external power to come and try and sort of enforce a little bit of order. So Athens more than once is the sort of enforcing power. The Spartans have a go at trying to, to make sense of things as well. Um, so if we go back to our agreements of 3876, there is clear continuity here uh, from the Cladzomenian perspective. They're in the same problem, facing the same problems that they've been facing since uh, the end of the fifth century. And the solution is the same solution. Get Athenian support to legitimate and enforce a settlement which makes it possible for Cladzomeni to continue to function uh, as, as a polis. Um, so what they have to offer in exchange is a fiscal concession. They have to agree to pay the 5% tax. What they get for that is Athenian backing for the Democrats, the Demos, to decide effectively what they want Cladzomeni to look like, um, what to do with their hostages, whether or not to reach a settlement with the splinter community, whether or not the exiles can come back. So what all of this adds up to is, a, is a, the continuation of an established pattern of behaviour. A faction in Cladzomeni draws on Athenian support to help solidify their own position. This is a well-attested and much-discussed feature of the 5th century empire, so it shouldn't surprise us, really, to find it also happening in the 4th century. I think what this example is useful is that it precisely brings out this, this, the continuity of this behaviour. There hasn't been a, a rupture in what the Athenians are doing, nor, from the Cladzomenian perspective, in what they hope to get out of Athens. Now, to reiterate... I don't want to give the impression that I think Athens in the 5th century or in this text is doing anything altruistic in making these deals. But there is in both contexts and on both sides a level of pragmatic negotiation, responsive to the circumstances and the objectives of both parties. So this text is certainly an expression of Athenian power, but it's an expression which is modulated to its context. It builds on an existing relationship and an existing pattern of interactions between the parties involved. It seems very likely to have arisen out of a process of negotiation between Athens and the Cladzomenians, so that it ends up with a settlement which is hopefully going to be workable for both sides, which doesn't re rely just on the threat of Athenian force uh, for, it to, for it to stick. And in fact, that negotiation just hinted at very briefly towards the start of the text concerning what they say there must have been Cladzomenian delegations going to Athens to explain what was going on and maybe to suggest, here's what would work for us, what would work for you. Uh, then the settlement is, is proposed and then the negotiation sort of carries on even in this text because there is some uh, quid pro quo on hostages and, and payment of, of, of tax and, and so on. Um We've just got time just to gesture very quickly to another text, which we won't go through in detail, but just to note that at, in the same year, in exactly the same region, so Erythrae is just, just along the coast, um, the Athenians are making another deal with the people of Erythrae, 
which in some ways is quite similar. There are similar things going on here. Again, there's been stasis. There's a question about what's going to happen to exiles. More explicit in this text is the problem or question of what the relationship is with the Persians just next door and how that's going to be handled. Um, so there's a sort of shared menu of concerns, but the way the details of this settlement are quite different from the details of the settlement for Clad's Omni. So it's absolutely not the case that the Athenian just has a just have a boilerplate settlement which they impose on all of these states. Um, they are very clearly doing different things in different contexts, even in the same geographical region and the same year. So both of these just carry the story down to 3787, which I'm, which I'm was meant to be talking about. Not, that is that is not relevant for either of these communities because uh, the Peace of Amtalgadas of, of 386, the King's Peace, um, under the terms of, of that peace, both of these communities are handed over or become part of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Uh, so their fate is then becomes out, out of out of their own hands and 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 part of part of the story of Persian history. But that's also part of the story of the Athenian Empire and how the Athenian Empire uh, must have been different for different communities. The communities in this bit of the world are really always also, I think, thinking about Persia as their neighbour. So, um, where does this leave us? To reiterate, I'm not, it's about the fourth time I've said this, but I do worry, I'm not trying to persuade you that Athenian imperialism or hegemony in the 5th or the 4th century was altruistic, nor am I trying to persuade you uh, that the Athenians, or at least some Athenians, didn't have some sort of guiding plan or guiding vision of what their, Athenian, what their imperial power should amount to. I think we do have to acknowledge that those plans were always, to some extent, fluid. A, a model that I'm sort of playing with and I haven't pinned down yet is, is there's some sort of balance between occasional attempts to sort of set up a plan and a model, the foundation of the Delian League, the Second Athenian League, and then the sort of perhaps inevitable way that stuff evolves and gets more messy and more complicated as soon as you try and put anything into practice. And then when you get to a certain level of messiness, then you, then you suddenly try and reimpose a bit of order. And I wonder if that's how we should explain things like the Charter of the Second Athenian League, possibly also the flurry of Athenian imperial regulations in the 420s. Um, this isn't uh, a sort of centenary callback uh, to the original Delian League, but it's more of an effort to, to formalise, reformalise some types of behaviour that have been knocking around uh, since 477 in one form or another and have never really gone away. So it's more of a reset uh, than a revival. When we look at stuff from the margins, I think we see two things. First is much, much more diversity. I've given you three, three and a half examples in this talk, but we could multiply them. Um, there are some similarities. There is a framework, but there's also a significant amount of variation, and that's driven by local contexts, by local priorities, also Athenian priorities in different regions, and also to some degree by local agency. Uh, and that also applies to the question of continuity and change from the 5th to the 5th century. For some communities, the world does change when Athenian power ebbs away uh, for in the last 15 years of the 5th century, and Miletus is my prime example here. For others, Eretria, Eulis, there's probably a more continuity, at least in, in some respects. For Cladzomini, the big turning point is nothing to do with Athens, or not directly to do with Athens. It's caused by the king's peace and shaped ultimately by the wider wider geopolitics of the eastern Aegean and western Anatolia. So to sum all that up in one or two sentences, set my slide the right way, um, empires like tyrants like to simplify. The experience of empire and the experience of studying empire is much more complicated. Thank you very much. Well, uh...